So we are here for the sea turtle ecology course. We'll do introductions in a second for all the people that are filtering in. Um, but uh, um, so we're going to do some some basic housekeeping here. And, and if you've done use Zoom before, then um, sorry, but uh, <laughs> we're going to go over this anyway. So at the bottom of your screen, you should. Um, uh, be able to see a little black bar that um, has a few options on it, right? Uh, mute, uh, video, um, uh, then there should be something for participants and for chat as well. Um, so um, the participants, you can just uh, see who's, who else is on there, but chat is sometimes useful to have open. Um, so that uh, uh, you can you can enter stuff in there. I don't see chat when I'm uh, sharing my screen, so um, that can be. Uh, it may take a while for me to notice. So if you have a question at any point, um, do not feel like you need to um, wait your turn to say something. Right? This is intended to be fairly informal. And so if you want to interrupt and uh, add to this course, you're, you're certainly welcome to do it, ask a question. Um, now, one of the things that um, is handy to do and, and is generally good um, policy when you're in a, a large group like this, if you go to that black bar that's down at the bottom and it says, um, where it says mute and audio, um, you should, mute yourself until you're intending to talk, right? Um, that's just so that when your dog barks in the background or somebody walks into the room and starts saying stuff that you don't, um, you don't interrupt the, the flow of the course just because your background noise is, is getting on there. And I think um, all the young people that are here probably all know that. Um, and, Bob and Kath, I think they just they just found that out, right? And figured out where it was. So good, everybody's got themselves muted. Um, but by all means, feel free to unmute and interrupt at any time. And just remember, you're muted because you can't. I can't hear you unless you unmute yourself. Uh, okay, so uh, um, I'm going to introduce a little bit about uh, this 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 course. We're using a format, uh, Scuba Schools International format. Um, that's the online portion of the course that you're taking, right? And now those of you have had a, uh, hopefully have had a chance to go through some of the online portion. Um, you, you will need to, um, you will need to complete the online portion and the final exam in order to earn your certification. You will also need to complete the forms that I that I will send you. If I haven't sent you to them yet, I will be doing that after the meeting. There was a lot of, Ian, you were the only one that signed up in advance and everybody else signed up today. <laughs> so very kind of a last minute thing, which is fine. Um, uh, but you will need to complete that before I can issue your um, certification. Um, there, you, no dives are required. It's kind of neat. Um, and then you will need to do the final exam and pass the final exam before I can issue your certification. But this is kind of the idea behind SSI. They have, this is, SSI believes in diver development, right? And um, obviously one of the things that we're not gonna be able to do here is experience and that's go diving, right? That's basically get in the water and go diving, right? Um, skills are usually developed also during a dive but they can also be developed in um, in a pool like environment so those of you that took an open water class would know that or um, like Ian is actually working on his dive professional development there's skill development at that level as well um, knowledge is kind of what we're doing now we're we're educating ourselves about the marine environment specifically here but that knowledge can also be development in nitrox in professional development in equipment there's all kinds of, of things to know about scuba diving and then, um, then equipment, right? SSI also promotes the ownership of equipment so that you can um, become very familiar with 
um, what you're using so that when you get in the water, um, you're not having issues with, with equipment. And they, they go into detail about a life support equipment, snorkeling equipment, wetsuit equipment. That doesn't really belong in this class, but this is basically the elements of creating a, an experienced diver, right? So um, I want to introduce you to um, uh, this, if you don't know it. Uh, this is the, uh, again, the SSI uh, levels of divers and how you move up in your level of diver, right? So when you start out diving, um, you, you learn an open water certification. That's the beginning dive level. Now there's some things you can do before that, like discover scuba diving. Um, but you get about five log dives doing that, a skin dive and four dives. Um, then um, uh, there's an intermediate level. They call that advanced adventurer, which would also be equivalent to a, a paddy open water course where you do different types of diving like navigation, uh, buoyancy, deep, and you, you get some a little bit more experience with an instructor. Now in the SSI system with the, with the level two diver, and I believe under the um, SSI system, when you've completed two specialty programs and log 12 dives, you're automatically issued a level two diver, right? Now, I know Ian is gonna earn that uh, today, right? The specialty diver rating. He's got a lot of dives, um, but he's just starting out in the SSI system. Um, uh, some of the rest of you are just doing your very first specialty course. Um, when you've done two and you've logged 12 dives, you're a level two diver. And then the next level in SSI is level three diver, which where you do four of these specialty courses. They can all be ecology courses, but they can also be diving courses as well, like boat diver, night diver, nitrox diver. You do four of those and log 24 dives, that's key. Logging 24 dives gives you that advanced rating, right? You don't pay for that advanced rating. You, uh, you pay for the dives as you go and for the, the specialty programs like you're, you're doing there. And then the master diver um, requires a, has a specific requirement of the stress and rescue, which is commonly just known as a rescue course. Um, you would need to do that to make the level four uh, diver. And that's where some of you, especially the ones that are related to me, I really want to see you, uh, re really want to see you get there before you uh, get out of high school so that you can leave as a master diver. Um, and then you can keep going. Some of these uh, dive levels are also, you get to the, that master diver level. And now when you just log dives, 100 log dives, two, level five, 200 log dives, level six, right? So I know Bob and Kath have more than 200 dives, so they would be level six working on level seven right now. And uh, me, I've been in the industry for 20 years, so I'm up down here at uh, level 10. But I just wanted to introduce you to that so that you knew what that was, because it's, it's fun to you know, get recognized as you move up the ranks. And so now what I wanna do is, um, I want to uh, show you, this is, this is really cool. Um, I want to share my screen with you and, and make sure that you're aware of um, uh, the, the app. Um, um, hopefully this works. Ah, there we go. Hey, okay, so hey Matt. Up here. Before you continue, I just have one quick question. Yeah, shoot. Um, so, you know, we're both PADI certification, PADI certified, so I'm advanced open water, and my daughter is junior open water. Okay. Um, how does this translate? How does this SSI cert translate over to, uh, can I use this for PADI, or do I have to pursue the SSI cert in order to do anything with it? The PADI, it depends what your goal is, right? Uh, it's a very good question, right? So, I know that... Um, Patty uh, does what Patty will do, or SSI will do, um, is allow me to take your certifications that you currently have and put them in the application and issue you equivalent credit, and that'll help you move up towards that master diver level. Um, I know that Patty and SSI will recognize each other's certifications up to the rescue level. 
And then at the professional level, that's when they stop agreeing on uh, allowing people to transfer back and forth. Um, but as a as a you know a customer of ours, if you'd like to um, uh, be able to uh, have me put your PADI certifications in the SSI app, the nice thing that's nice thing about that is that is a free service, and your cards are in your phone now, and they're and your cards are uh, uploaded to the cloud. And so if you've ever gone diving on a dive trip and forgotten your card, that happens to everybody all the time, but nobody ever goes anywhere without their phone. So there's, <laughs> there's a pretty strong incentive to, uh, put things up in, into your phone. Um, and it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to show you that because it looks like for whatever reason, my, uh, um, this application is not talking to my phone right now. But all I was gonna show you is where your cards are located in your SSI app and try to convince you to download that SSI app onto your phone. It's called My SSI and the, and the uh, logo is 50. And then I was gonna show you where to, where, to, where to find your cards. And you can also, if you haven't figured it out, do your online training for your programs on your phone. You don't have to do it on your computer. You can also do it on your phone, and they and they sync back and forth. So that was the the, the point of that one. Okay, so that was the housekeeping portion. We're going to go into uh, uh, what we have, what I have uh, planned. And just so you know, like I said, I'm I am not going to. Um, uh beat you over the head with the material that you're learning already because how, how many actually i'm going to bring people up again um uh, how many people were able to get um through the online learning ian were you able to get through it he was able to get through it um how about may how far did you get in the online learning you got all the way through it Nice. Okay. Not all the way, but like part of the way through it. Okay. So. How about you, Zane? I I currently just finished the review section three. So. Okay. Good. And uh, Cora, how far did you get? We downloaded it. <laughs> we got it in the class today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know they, the the I know that there's a uh, 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 Cora, May, Zane. They all within hours have uh, decided to take the course. So. Um, what I'm go not going to do is go specifically through the course. Um, this is, as you know, what the, what the course looks like, right? Um, um, what I've seen other um, people do is they open this up and they start reading the bullet points to uh, people that have already signed up, in many cases have already taken the course, right? What I have done is I took the course myself and um, applied the you know the knowledge and my interest to uh, different um, parts of the course and when I got to something that I thought I had value added on then I would um, uh, I made little notes for myself here you can make notes and then I um, made links and and i'm i'm always going to have access to this these notes are always going to stay with my online learning and then i took those links and that information and i applied it to a powerpoint presentation i'm going to share with you so different parts of the course and this one was an excellent uh video that um that i found that is going to cover a lot of what we are going to talk about in this course so uh, I am going to play this first. I am fairly confident that you will be able to hear the audio as well as the video. If you do not hear the audio, please stop me. Sea turtles are ancient mariners. Present in all but Earth's coldest oceans, these marine reptiles are well adapted to a life on the moon. Sea turtles have existed since the time of the dinosaurs. The earliest known marine turtle lived about 120 million years ago. 
named Desmatotulus padeli. It was six feet long and had the characteristic features of modern sea turtles, including a carapace or top shell and paddle-like limbs. Today, there are seven species of sea turtles, with the largest being the leatherback. Growing as long as eight feet and weighing up to 2,000 pounds, it is larger than known fossils of its prehistoric ancestor, D. padeli. Sea turtles can lay more than 150 eggs at a time. Called the clutch, these large egg deposits help ensure the survival of sea turtle hatchlings. Once a female lays her eggs, she returns to the sea, leaving her hatchlings to fend for themselves. Fewer than 0.1% of hatchlings survive to adulthood, in part due to numerous predators on the beach. Emerging in large numbers increases the chance that some will survive. A sea turtle's sex is determined by temperature. Unlike most vertebrates, a sea turtle's sex is not determined by sex chromosomes. Instead, the temperature of the nest determines the sex of the hatchlings. When temperatures are warm, at about 88 degrees Fahrenheit, most of the hatchlings will be female. But when temperatures are cooler, less than around 82 degrees Fahrenheit, most of the hatchlings will be male. Sea turtles use Earth's magnetic fields to navigate. Sea turtles have geomagnetic abilities, which serve as an internal GPS. The turtles have particles of magnetite, a magnetic mineral, in their brains. The magnetite likely plays a role in orienting sea turtles to Earth's magnetic poles, similar to a compass. Baby sea turtles imprint on the unique magnetic signature of the beaches where they hatch. This magnetic map can guide them back to the same beaches several years later to lay their own eggs. All seven sea turtle species are threatened with extinction. Once abundant, sea turtle populations have dramatically declined in the past two centuries. Fishing is a major threat to sea turtles as they become caught in fishing nets as bycatch or accidental catch. Illegal harvesting of turtle eggs, trafficking in turtle products, and ocean pollution are also concerns. However, policies have been enacted to reduce bycatch, protect turtle habitats, and prohibit the killing of sea turtles and their eggs. By continuing this kind of intervention, humans can help stop the decline of sea turtles, helping keep these ancient mariners in the world's oceans. All right. So those of you guys who, oh, I better put this on pause or it'll keep going in the background. Um, so for those of you who finished the, the class, um the uh that had a very it touched on a lot of the topics right um it that that's why i showed that particular video it was a nice introduction right it talked about uh the, the nesting the mig it didn't really talk that much about the migration um but also the hatching and then one of the things that didn't really get included i noticed in our um, class was how sea turtles navigate um, so that is uh, very interesting. I didn't explore that too much further in my additional uh, uh, research in, into so turtle ecology, but you should be aware that, um, you know, sea turtles do come back to the nest, uh, the same beach at which they were hatched, and that's where they lay their, their eggs. And they are using the Earth's magnetic field to get back there. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty fascinating in and of itself. Okay. So, um, everybody still with me? Anybody, everybody able to hear the video? Good? Yeah? All right, so, I'm um, gonna go back to sharing the screen. Okay, so the next, um, uh, let's see if I can move this on to the next slide. Okay, so 
the next slide I thought that the um, if you can see here in the um, I didn't think that was a very good slide that they had in the SSI presentation you couldn't really tell what the turtles look like so I found um, this one that I thought was a lot better right for the seven different types of species that are in existence now you guys all know that, well if you've got that far into the thing that there are seven different species right now this species the leatherback is in a different genus than the other six species um, but we're going to we're going to show some videos and pictures of these as we go along in this class but just to go over them so that we know what we're talking about the leatherback and it's called leatherback because it's the only one without a hard shell right it, this uh this back here isn't a hard shell it's um uh it is softer but leathery, right? And then these six turtles all belong to a different um, species. Um, I did not find any really good information on flat flatbacks, um, and I've never seen one of these. Um, and I'm not 100% positive I've seen the Kemp's Ridley or Olive Ridley turtle before, um, but we have a really good video. So we're gonna show that in a second. I'm gonna talk a little bit about these um, they made a big deal about in the video talking about how you identify the different types of turtles, right? And they talked about uh, these scoots, right? And then the prefrontal scales, right? These are the prefrontal scales. And this is one of your quiz questions. We haven't taken it yet. This, this, how many scales are up here on the top of the head or one of the ways they identify different types of, of turtles, Right, and then you have the verbal scoots, ones across the back, the marginal ones on the margin of the shell, right, and the costal, I guess that's how you say that. Those are the ones that are in between, I guess. Um, this, this was another uh, little bit better pictures of the different types of uh, turtles that, uh, this is a NOAA slide. Um, and uh, you can see these are the ones that basically that uh, the ones that aren't on here are flat packs not on here. And uh, what's the other one's not on here? Oxbill Green, Olive Ridley, Waterhead. Oh, Hawksville. There's no Hawksville on here. I guess there's no Hawksville. Oh. oh, oh. Uh, I guess there's no Hawksville in U.S. waters either. Um, but um, the one that we have out here in Hawaii is the green sea turtle, and that's the one that, uh, uh, that we see all the time, right? Uh, we do see the Hawksville every once in a while. Oh, there is Hawksville on here. So it's the olive ridley that's not on there. Okay. Uh, this Hawksville is the way that you pick it out um, is you can see that it's got that really sharp little beak, right? And then it's got like a very saw like uh, right on here on the end of the tail, the marginal scoots, they're real sharp. Whereas on the this green sea turtle, they're kind of, they're kind of flat around the edge. Same with the loggerhead. Um, so that's a little bit better uh, how to, what they look like in general without getting too, too scientific. You can see on this slide uh, that they, uh, you can see the pattern of these, um, Scoots is, is very different, right? Um, very, very different pattern. So that's how, um, how you can start to uh, look at identifying those. Okay. Um, this was maybe a little bit out of order, but I found this when I was, no, so we have green sea turtles here in Hawaii, and then they had this news article um i'm gonna go back i'm gonna stop screen sharing real quick um just so i can see you guys everybody everybody good everybody still following me i'm not hearing anybody just give me a thumbs up you're following yeah. good all right and then over here on the the other side you can see a yes no uh under participants that's also a, a way to, you know, give me uh, uh, verbal feedback or nonverbal feedback. That's good, Corey. All right, you guys are with me. All right. Um, this was really interesting. I didn't even know about this. This apparently happened last year. 
um, that they found an olive ridley sea turtle nest in the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, and apparently it was the sixth one. I had never even heard of this. So olive ridley is one of the uh, types of um, sea turtles. And, and apparently what happened was these, uh, uh, these guys were sitting on the beach in Kailua and baby sea turtles started emerging from the nest under their towel on the beach. <laughs> and then, um, the, you know, they called somebody and uh, researchers flew out here and, uh, you know, it became a big, um, you can see the, the researchers are here now involved. Um, it was pretty interesting stuff. Um, they so found Mel, you're, you're not sharing your screen anymore. Oh, sorry. Oops. Okay. Let's go back and share screen go back to that okay good here we go so back to this uh this was a news article right um and from october of last year and um this is the you know kailua beach this is right around the corner from us and uh was, you know these are the scientists coming out and um our uh, uh they counted the eggs and, you know, they were 72 eggs, 64 were viable, it was like 90% success rate. I guess these are some of the researchers and the people that, um, uh, you know, kind of lucked into this thing. Um, this is the, and, and I, I just thought this was pretty exciting thing to find. So you know, stay observant and you can find, find some, some really cool stuff. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to get back to the. Um, okay, so the next section in the. Uh, so these um, sea turtle colony here. So in you guys are familiar with this was app was um, was the. Uh, identifying the species. And then I'll talk briefly about this, the crawl, right? The crawl was, does anybody remember what that was? Anybody that remembers what the crawl is, go ahead and, and just uh, share if you remember. What that was. May, how about you? Do you remember what the crawl was? Did you get that far in this? Not yet. Okay. Uh, I know Cora didn't. How about Ian? Did you get that far? Yeah. The crawl is a pattern in the sand that the female turtles leave when they're coming up on beach to nest. Right. So that's exactly right. You'll pick that up, you guys, when you when you do the online learning. That's kind of interesting to, to know. Um, uh, the nesting is now what, what I'm going to show this, this next video is about. So sometimes they come up these uh, they come up individually and they put their nests and they got to put them above the high tide marker and the reason they got to do that uh, they got to put them above where the eggs are um, they got to dig down drop the eggs in the hole but if they if that hole is below the, the water mark and the eggs stay submerged then they can't exchange gases in and out and then the, all the eggs will die so um, Sometimes they do that individually, and then sometimes they do it like this. So this is a video I found of replacing Costa Rica. Who we're doing a, we're doing a Costa Rica trip next year, but now we're modifying our dates because we're, we're going to go see this. This is in Ostanal, uh, in in Costa Rica, and it looks pretty. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Thank you guys for tuning in. YouTube channel, but we're gonna see the turtles on the beach, and there's no ATM in the town here of Ostiernal. So we went down to Nosara, which is the next town south of here. It's about 20 minute drive. Came back, now we're ready for the tour. Let's do it. Holy crap, guys, we found our first turtle. Check this out. These are olive ridley. Look at him go, or her rather. I'm 
going to pause that for a second too on, and tell you um, something else I, I didn't really, uh, wasn't too aware of is that one of the reasons these turtles will, will still go and, and just kind of ignore people is apparently scientists have determined that they go into a somewhat of a, a fugue state where they where they're very single-minded, they ignore other stimulus where they would normally not let people get close to them and stuff. When this is going on, they just kind of ignore other stimuli, they go lay their eggs and they leave and they kind of ignore everything else. So um, another interesting thing about this, about that particular area um, was... Now these uh, turtles are called the olive ridden... Um, uh, was that um, these, these people that are in that area have, uh, they've made the turtles themselves into uh, a large part of what they do for a living down there, right? That that's the fact that this happens and they, they have this tour industry, that whole area is like, it happens apparently like once a month and, and then no one is allowed onto the beach during that time unless you go with the guide, right? You have to go with a guide, so there's a local job, right? And then they time these, um, you saw how many turtles they, there were there, right? So they time these, um, uh, turtle deposit times, these, these nesting times, and they allow the locals to go in there at the beginning of the nesting and harvest the turtles' eggs that up until like a third of the way or half of the way in because so many of the uh, eggs are destroyed from the turtles that lay early because the other turtles dig up their nests and destroy them. So they, there is an actually a, a sustainable harvest of these type of eggs, and you can actually buy the eggs in the local market there. And it's a little bit controversial, but it's, you know, this is obviously something that's been fairly well managed because there's a lot of turtles right there. So, you know, when it comes into con conservation, and you'll do that in the very last chapter of your class talking about conservation, um, letting people make a living off of, this, these kind of natural events sometimes is the best way to protect them because people are, um, they are very interested. Like there's rangers there making sure you're with the guide. They're protecting that because it's important to their livelihood. So um, pretty interesting. Okay, so um, oh, I better go back to screen share, go back to next. Okay, this is, um, this gets pretty geeky right here. So do you guys remember um, uh, the fact that turtles, are you, turtles when they're at lower temperature, when the eggs are at lower temperature, most of them become males. And then at a higher temperature, most of them become females. So that's, this is actually from a, a researcher, a scientific paper, right? These are the, you know, the authors um, from 
Um, this is Science Magazine, and you know, I've, I've uh, it's been a long time since I've read a paper, right? I got a PhD in molecular biology, so this lets my nerd come out a little bit, but I'm just gonna point this out to you that it's actually a specific gene, right? Um, that, 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 that single-handedly one gene makes this happen, right? And um, uh, that gene is uh, uh, this KDM6B, right? Which is a uh, dimethylase, right? So probably, probably shouldn't go too far in that. The dimethylase takes a, a, a methyl, uh, uh, there's apparently three methyls uh, uh, on this HK, uh, this other protein right here, and it takes them off, and that allows that um, uh, that allows it to stop expressing this other gene, right? So um, the point the point being is, if they kill this gene, they can make all of the uh, they can make all of the turtles uh, into females, and then if they overexpress uh, this this gene, the DMRT, that turns it back on, and makes them all. Uh, the other way around. So, um, pretty interesting. Um, pretty interesting stuff. Uh, and 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 these scientific papers. If you ever get into marine biology, right? Um, and you are really interested. This is the kind of stuff that you're gonna you're gonna learn, right? Um, it gets pretty technical. I mean, to understand this, you would have to understand gene transcription. You'd have to understand uh, gene knockout experiments overexpression of genes. Um, you'd have to understand how the dimethylase work and how the uh, uh, transcriptional promoter all work on the genome. It's, it's pretty interesting stuff. Um, what was probably the most interesting to me is this one particular science paper. Um, that's why it made it into the journal Science, which is one of the best ones. Really, they figured out what gene made that happen, which was Pretty cool and not maybe the super easiest thing for them to do. I'm sure they're pretty proud of their paper. Um, okay, so in um, hatching, we had uh, the the next thing that we uh, the next thing in the uh, in your class would have been going from nesting. Um, we talked a little bit about the temperature and incubation, and then in hatching, um, I just thought that uh, what was really cool is they didn't really have any good videos of that. And so we're gonna play, this is a BBC. And so I think we have a couple of BBC ones and it's gonna talk about hatching. It's also gonna talk a little, it's gonna touch a little bit on migration as well. But we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and watch this video. Swimmers also come to Ascension to breed. A female green turtle approaches the coast. She's not eaten once in two months. She may have traveled 1,000 miles from her feeding grounds, the greatest journey of her kind. Many others are here too, resting on the sandy sea floor, awaiting the darkness of night when it will be safer to visit the beaches. Eggs that were laid a few weeks ago at the start of the season are beginning to hatch. Hatchings happen at night. Now, in the light of day, the young are extremely vulnerable. They must get to the sea as soon as possible. But their trials have only just begun. Many will drown in the pounding waves.
next 20 years, the vast majority will inevitably die. But those that survive will eventually, as their mothers did before them, return to the very same beach where they were hatched. How they find their way back across thousands of miles of open ocean, we still have no idea. So that last part wasn't completely true, right? We already talked about they still have no idea. Well, they actually do have some idea how that works. They're, they're not, no one's positive on how that works exactly. Um, but that magnetite in the head is a pretty strong uh, indication that it, that's, uh, there's something. Um, okay, the next section was, uh, um, they talked about uh, adaptations of the sea turtle for migrations. And they talked about how that the um, front of the, the seven remaining species, the, the two back um, flippers, or the two back ones, flippers were more like rudders. But on, on this extinct pileos, uh, pileosaur, um, all four, um, flippers were, uh, all, all four appendages were flippers, and then they had what they think was a little rudder. The tail was a bit of a rudder, right? And I just thought this was interesting because in, inside of the uh, uh, actual class, they talked about extinct paleosaurs, but then they didn't, um, they didn't talk anything about um, what a paleosaur was. So, I went and found an artist's rendition of a Pleo. Sorry, you can see that was pretty cool. So some of those extinct turtles were pretty good size. Um, okay, um, I didn't know where to put this. Um, the, the again going back to the, uh, um, the they start talking about specific videos about how to identify different types of turtles. Um, they didn't really have a section for hawksbill turtles. But this was really cool. So um, we're, we're going to watch this particular video as well. Um, and you can see my title here is random but neat. So have any of you guys ever heard of uh, uh, diving with uh, fluorescent lights? And then so you can actually dive with the fluorescent light. And then you put a filter over your uh, mask, right? They, you come with a fluorescent light flashlight and then a filter that goes over your mask and then you can see all the animals that bioluminesce underwater right it's called fluoro diving right if you never heard of it now you have it's a thing they do one of the dive resorts we go into the philippines they have it set up and people do that did you do it ian you were there did you do the fluoro dive yeah i did it um <laughs> Two different times, once with uh, Pete and then all, the other time with uh, Danny and Karen. Oh, okay, cool. So you did this. Well, you'll, you'll definitely appreciate this. Apparently, Hawksbill's bioluminesce. So we're going we're gonna to watch that video now, just mostly because it's cool. Wait, what did you find? We found a biofluorescent turtle. Turtle. The scientists have only really tuned in to biofluorescence in the last 10 years. And as soon as we started tuning into it, we started to find it everywhere. First it was in corals and jellyfish, then it was in fish, and there it was, this UFO. This turtle was just hanging out with us. It was, so, it was in love with the light. It was just hanging out with us, and it was glowing neon yellow. <laughs> yeah, this is the first, the first I've ever seen of a biofluorescent turtle. Spectacular. Okay, so you're up now. All right, we're going in. I was in the Solomon Islands on a TBA 21 Academy expedition, which is a new group that pairs up artists and scientists to do different projects related to the marine environment. I'm taking pictures of some corals that we already knew were biofluorescent. And then in the middle, I guess maybe 40 minutes into the dive, out of the blue, it almost looks like a bright red and green spaceship, you know, came underneath my camera. 
the only animal that I really can tell you definitively has two colors is corals. You know, we found lots of fluorescence in marine eels, and it's all green fluorescence, and lots of fluorescence in gobies, and that's mainly red fluorescence. So until we actually get a hold of one of these turtles and really start to look at it chemically, we wouldn't know what it is. Beautiful stripes, you know, green across the head, across the yeah. back. Um, it just bumps into us. It just basically, I was filming coral, and then it came in front of my lens and then hung out with us for, for like know, five minutes. minutes, five yeah. minutes, something like that. And then he went down Super deep. calm. I mean, I've never seen a turtle that calm. Yeah. I've never seen I wanted it. to let him go after yeah. a little bit. I felt like he yeah. came and he divulged his secret. Yeah. That was enough. It was enough to get this first little bit of footage, which really shows that turtles are biofluorescent. Now it opens up all these new questions to us of what is it doing in these turtles? We know they have really good vision, they go under these long and arduous migrations, but how are they using this? Are they using it to find each other? Or are they using it to attract each other? What's even more sad, I think, about this is that these turtles have such a storied history and now they're critically endangered. There's some places where there's just a, a few thousand breeding females remaining. That was that was interesting doesn't it there was no part of our class that talked about bioluminescence of turtles so i thought that was kind of fun to add in there um the next one of the sections in that uh thing was talking about leatherback uh turtles and i have never seen a leatherback turtle in the wild so i was pretty interested to sh uh see that now after we see this video on leatherbacks, I found another really good thing of talking about how uh, leatherbacks control some of their saltwater intake. But um, this was my favorite video on what a leatherback looks like. If climate change raises sea levels, it could wipe out beaches that are vital for endangered migrants that come here from thousands of miles away. Leatherback sea turtles. They can reach seven feet long and weigh as much as a ton. And they sustain this vast bulk on little more than jellyfish. But these giants are at risk from pollution and industrial scale fisheries. Hundreds drown each year, tangled in nets or hooked on long lines. Leatherback numbers have dropped by around 70% in the last 40 years. Panama provides critical nesting sites. In spring, turtles leave foraging grounds that could be as far north as Nova Scotia and swim thousands of miles to Panama's warm tropical beaches. These long migrations could take them through dangerous fishing grounds, but the details of their journey are little known. It's now late May. After two or even three years in the vast ocean, females will be gathering off the coast. They will come ashore to lay their eggs after dark. Only then will the team get the chance to tag a leatherback. Tracking the turtles is the only way for researchers to know exactly where they go and identify dangers they might encounter. Dan, Dan, Dan. Dan, come here. Yeah, this looks like a track. This is definitely a leatherback track, looking at the size of it. Leatherback track? I don't think that scientist was using the correct term, right? We all know the term for that. It's called a crawl. Where is she? At the end of the track, a female at just the right stage of the nesting process. Okay, I'm going to back that up just a little bit because part of your class is to is to know a little bit about uh, right stage of the nesting process. Um, uh, adaptation for a turtle, right? Is uh, female at just the right stage of the nesting process. Now it's a race against time, and that's how uh, the turtle uh, has very very big lacrimal glands or tear ducts. 
and that's how it gets rid of a lot of the salt that it ingests to keep its salt balance in its body. You will learn more details of that in your class, but that was the one of the reasons I included this particular video is that was a kind of a shot of those tear ducts being very active and what they're secreting is a highly salt, uh, highly salt containing fluid or sticky goo, right? That looks, makes it looks like the turtle is crying, right? Uh, and that's the lacrimal gland and that's how it's uh, maintaining, uh, getting rid of some of the salt in its body. Say that one more time. Now, at just the right stage of the nesting process. Now it's a race against time. Okay, let's go. Rapido, rapido. The team switches to red headlamps. We use the red lights because sea turtles don't see red very well. It tends not to disturb them. While she's laying, she goes into a kind of trance so they can attach the satellite transmitter without bothering her. Okay, so you hold on to that and do the putty. And that's gonna act as a, as a cushion here so that we don't do any damage at all to this, to this central ridge. So we have to work quite quickly with this just because it sets quite hard. We're doing pretty well. She's still laying her eggs. Okay. The transmitter's sitting nice and tight as it should be, but there's still room for her to grow a little. This is the latest generation satellite tag for Leatherbacks. It's capable of tracking the turtle's exact movements in almost real time for about four years. The satellite transmitter can tell us a lot of information about not only where she's going, but how fast she's going there. And from that, we can actually even determine behavior, whether or not she's just migrating, swimming uh, distances between areas, or if she's actually slowing down to feed and forage in an area. Oh, perfect time. Yeah, so that's great. So she's now gonna start covering. You know, she uses these rear flippers to cover those eggs up with a, you know, a good covering of sand, pressing it down to make sure that the, you know, the eggs are, are well protected. <laughs> Looks good. Ready to go. She'll spend the next two or three years at sea until she nests again, and she'll almost certainly return to this very beach to do so. So again, that was. Um part of uh, the very last section of your, uh, of your course, we'll talk about uh, how conservation is working. And one of the things they talked about is tagging turtles either through tagging their flippers or uh, when they're young or what you just saw. So uh, those are part of conservation. Um, okay, so this next oh, Matt, one. I, I have a question about that. Yeah, shoot. So I'm guessing because turtles are primarily tagged when they're coming up to nest, most of the information we have are on the female turtles. Do we know if there's any differences between behaviors or migration patterns of male and female turtles? Or do we just kind of assume they're the same? Hmm, that's a really good question. And I do not know the answer. Um, they, so, I'm going to guess that when they tag them as um, uh, hatchlings, like sometimes they're tagging them as they go into the water as babies, that some of the migration data would be for made male turtles. Um, uh, I have seen turtles off of spitting caves here in Hawaii Kai that have these metal tags on their flippers, but they don't look like they, they were tagged when they were babies, right? These are like, large metal tags, the same, same like you might see on the, you put them on the monk seals sometimes. Um, that's a good question. I did not find any uh, uh, particular data or anything um, that said that they knew more about females than males. They do tend to focus on the, the nesting patterns. Um, one of the other things that uh, was pretty interesting about the mating patterns though, and um, for those of you, I know Ian, I'm sure you picked this up, for those of you who haven't got through it yet, is uh, male and female turtles mate at sea, and then the female actually stores the male sperm in her body, and right before she lays her eggs, she uses the male sperm to fertilize the eggs, right? It's 
it's bizarre. I've never heard of anything like that, but uh, that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, one of the other things you're going to learn in your, uh, in your course, if you haven't gone through the online course yet, is, is looking at um, how turtles maintain their, uh, what are their strategies to maintain um, their uh, not getting so salty that they die. Right, so they have to have a way to keep the salt water out of their bodies, and we already talked about one of those. Right, it was the lacrimal glands, and that's the turtle crying salt, basically. Right now, you wouldn't see that underwater because it just dissolves away. Right, the other way they deal with that is by having their uh, their shells and their scoots and stuff and their skin as all the barrier to salt. Salt doesn't come in through that. Right. Whereas human beings, right, you've been in the salt water for a long time, your skin changes, right? You get it, you get that uh, it starts to feel weird, right? Well, the interest the other interesting one was actually expelling seawater after they um, uh, after they eat their jellyfish, right? And so that's what this one is, is the sea turtles anti barfing spikes plastic bags problem. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, Matt. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I want to, uh, the uh, the crying with the eyes, do all species of turtles do that or just the leatherback? All of them. All of them. Okay, because I was, happened to be watching the National Geographic <laughs> showing a turtle nesting thing today and I didn't pay any attention to the species, but the turtle on the nest was doing that big gobs of uh, slime or salt, you know, coming down the eyes while she was nesting. Yeah, so, so the... Uh, well, they all do that, not just the leatherback. They all do it, right? Um, and it's, you know, you, you just don't notice it. They're doing it while they're in the water, too, but you don't really notice it when they're in the water, right? You, it's when they come out, to, they don't come out of the water that often. All right, so this is pretty interesting. This is just a um this is a i believe this is a leatherback right but this is going to talk about um uh th this is the inside of a sea turtle's mouth and that's to make the jellyfish go in right so the this guy is eating the jellyfish or whatever and he's got spikes they're pointed backwards and the spikes are going uh in the esophagus and the barbs are facing backwards so the jellyfish goes in um, but what he's going to do, they swallow a lot of seawater. The seawater is a problem, right? Because it's got a lot of salt in it, right? And so this is the leatherback with the swallowed a bunch of jellyfish, and he's got a bunch of water in his stomach, and so he's got a way to get to compress all of that water and barf out the water. All right, so I'm assuming green sea turtles do this too because they eat a lot of uh, vegetable matter, right? And so what these spikes are doing is basically preventing the stuff, the, the, the jellyfish from coming out when he forces all the water out, right? So this is a green, is a turtle, right? That's on the, on land, it looks like he's sick, but he's not really sick, he's, getting rid of water so he can regulate his osmotic pressure in his body, right? Um, so uh, um, that's what that is, right? Now, then it goes into uh, why is this a problem for the pollution that's out there, right? And the plastics of the ocean is the same thing happens, right? Now that they're, you know, he swallowed a paper bag and stuff. Now he's got this paper bag in his guts, and he's in he's in trouble, right? So um, that's a a little bit of a problem. That that one of the reasons green sea turtles uh, could be in trouble is that uh, they've got this particular adaptation. But then now when they do these when they have these plastics. Uh, you know, that's a bigger problem for them than it might normally be. Okay, so I found another cool website when I was doing this. So this is the name of a leatherback sea turtle, okay? 
So what we're going to do now is we're going to learn how to pronounce this name. And I'm doing this more for mostly, I know there's some young people in here. You're going to be seeing as you go through your education, you're going to get all kinds of words and stuff. You see this website, emmasane.com, right? All, all this website does is uh, uh, pronounce things for you. That was amazing. I was like, okay, that's cool. Uh, is it not does working? Does it do primarily English or does it do other languages as well? It had everything. Dermacellus. It has everything in it, right? I Oh, sorry. I don't know. I didn't try any Spanish or anything else. Dermacellus. Coriaracea, Dermacalis, Coriaracea, Dermacalis, Coriaracea. So that was fun. When I realized I could do this on uh, PowerPoint, I was had a good time putting this together for you guys. So <laughs> now you've learned how to, now you have, I think maybe and more important than you guys knowing how to pronounce this as, um, as you are students of life and you go forward, you are eventually going to come against some words and you need to give one of these presentations to somebody who affects your job and you don't know how to pronounce it and you, now you know, but I can go to msane.com and learn how to pronounce things properly. Uh, I think that's a fantastic life skill for you guys. So, um, and I was curious how to pronounce that myself. That's how I got there. And um, I'm not Dermacellus, Coriaacea. It's not easy, right? Okay. Um, also, in the uh, threats, and this was in the final section of uh, the class, right? Um, Sea Trail Ecology class. In the final section, living in the seas, threats and conservation. They have natural threats, anthropogenic threats, conservation. We already started talking a little bit about these. Um, uh, this is something that we were very familiar with in Hawaii uh, about 10 years ago. Um, this is the, uh, you know, if anybody heard of the book Fire in the Turtle House, they were talking about how all turtles were going to be extinct and we were we're not going to have any turtles anymore because of this particular disease right they know that it's caused by a type of herpes virus and it and it created these um uh fibroids on the turtle now that the fibroids themselves didn't kill the turtle but you can see if they got big enough like that turtle's almost blind right um and some of them got in the way of them eating because they grew around the mouth Right, and so you know, once the once the you know once the turtle can't see anymore, he's not going to be able to eat, and he's going to die. Right. So um, the good news here is, and this is uh, just from us because we go diving every day, is we barely ever see this anymore. Right. Either all the ones the turtles that had it died, or it or the the ones that are still around are resistant to it, but we hardly ever see this particular disease anymore and the turtle population seems to be doing quite well so happy story is that this doesn't seem to be a big deal anymore at least on a walk um okay so that was the end of um my slideshow uh i am not going to make you guys do you guys are going to need to do this on your own all you students out there this final exam you're going to need to pass that uh, these particular quizzes that are in the reviews, you don't really need to, to pass those, but you do need to do these exams. The thing about the exam questions is they're the same as the quiz questions, right? Just a few less of them. So you are going to have to pass the final exam. You get, you get unlimited tries, but you do have to, you can't just get the answer wrong and try again. You have to go through the whole exam. So, uh, it's kind of a bummer when you miss one. <laughs> I guess you've got to go back and do the whole thing again. Um, does force it does force you to learn by reputation. Okay, so that was most of the class, except for 
This was also the fun part for me. Uh, we're about an hour in, and that's about how long I planned it, planned it to be. But I want to share with you um, one of the reasons we found this so interesting is some uh, videos and photos from around Hawaii. Um, and uh, these are pictures that uh, uh, I or my staff have taken, mostly me, because I had them on my computer. So uh, locally here in Hawaii, we have a place called the Sea Cave, which is out of Hawaii Kai, and it's around the corner on a wall. And this is a picture uh, of a green sea turtle um, at the Sea Cave, right? Um, pretty nice. This one was, is this at Fantasy Reef? I'm gonna have to go back because I don't remember where it was. Oh, no, this one was at um, Turtle Canyons. Um, which is uh, a shallow dive site that we take first time divers to pretty much every day, right? And one of the reasons that people like to go diving for first time in Hawaii is you're almost certain to see one of these green sea turtles. Um, this is another green sea turtle. We see a lot of green sea turtles, almost only green sea turtles here. And this one's at one of our wreck diving sites and you can see that the Y0257 is in the background uh, the chain here is the mooring line that the boat is hooked, to, hooked up to. And this is a green sea turtle. He's hanging out at about 60 feet, just resting. This is a green sea turtle also resting. He's at a uh, dive site called Kahala Barge, right? Which is, um, comes out of the island diver's shop. It's about a 20 minute boat ride. It's, this is about, that turtle is resting at about 90 feet. So they, when they're not feeding, they'll just sleep on the bottom. They can hold their breath for a couple of hours at least. Um, this is um, a picture from a place called uh, Sea Cave. It's a little bit of an area where there's a, a, a cave against the wall and then a big drop off. Um, really nice type site in Oahu. Uh, picture, I, this one was actually this year, um, recent, recent picture. Uh, same dive actually slightly uh, there was a lot of turtles out there that day um, you can they were swimming up and down the wall uh, really fun okay so now, now this was a picture I got to remember this is does anybody want a uh, chance a guess at what kind of turtle this was is that a hawksbill it is a hawksbill Okay, and you can tell because these the other green sea turtles they didn't have quite such a pointy hawk bill, and then you can also tell back here, right? You can see these these marginal scoots are much more sharper and pronounced, right? Um, let's see if we can go back. You see how these are? This is a green sea turtle, right? And those scoots, the marginal scoots on the side, they're not pointed and sharp, but this. Uh, Hawksville is not the same, right? Now let me remember, where did I, Hawksville? Okay, so this Hawksville wasn't in Hawaii. This was from one of our trips. Uh, we were in Cozumel, right? We do dive trips. If you guys didn't know that, I'm pretty, pretty sure you do. Uh, but um, the, uh, this is a picture that we took from there, okay? And sharing some of these pictures with you because I thought it would be fun. How big was that hawksbill? Say again? How big was that hawksbill? That one was a juvenile. Uh, it didn't look that big in the picture and I remember when we were diving this, um, this is one of, uh, this was the deep side of, Col of Columbia. Um, I think it was smaller than the average green sea turtle. It, it, how long maybe maybe from the front of the top of the shell to the back maybe two feet it wasn't real tiny but um it wasn't real big either not that not for this turtle the turtles vary a lot in sizes out here we see green sea turtles some of them are you know the back of the shell is only a little over one feet and some of them we see some big ones man it's like three feet long right they range a lot in size you know 
I did not see any information on this while I was researching uh, this particular um, uh, presentation, but I have heard in the past that a turtle, as long as it's alive, will keep growing. They never stop growing. So a really, really big turtle is probably a pretty old turtle. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna share with you, I've got some videos here. And the loggerhead video is from a trip we took to Belize. Um, the hawksbill turtle was another, not that hawksbill turtle we just saw, but it was in Cozumel. And then I've got two videos of green sea turtles in um, that we took here while we were in Hawaii. Kai. I took all these videos. So um, we didn't do too much with the loggerhead, so we're going to start with the loggerhead video. <laughs> see a video of a hawksbill turtle. This was in Cozumel. video is good because you can see that um, see this pattern right now this is not something that I had particularly noticed until I had gone through this class myself but this pattern of these scoots on his uh, his costal scoots and the ones that are on the back they they have a different overlapping pattern than other kinds of turtles so if you pay attention to those video the, to those um, uh, slides that uh, that uh, that I have shown you, and I'm going to send everybody this presentation when this is done. Uh, you you can see that um, those are uh, you you can identify turtles by their by their scoot pattern. Okay. <laughs> So that dive site that we were at um, was at a place called Palancar Reef. It's a very famous dive site. Um, if you're an uh, American diver, right, you, do, you live in the mainland of the United States, you will uh, probably eventually go to Cozumel and go diving um, just because it's, it's close and it's really good. Um, Okay, this is an excellent video, not for the scenery that it's around, but you can see a bunch of uh, green sea turtles uh, at rest um, in about 35 feet of water outside of White at a place called Turtle Beach. This is very near a uh, turtle feeding station. Not at the turtle feeding station, you can see the fish aren't there.
And one more video of green sea turtles at spitting cave. <laughs> Okay, you guys, that is all I had for uh, tonight. I was just uh, basically what, um, again, you have is you have the online learning and you actually don't need these particular enrichment sessions to get your certification. Um, hopefully you enjoyed it, however. I certainly enjoyed putting it together. Um, probably gonna do the same thing for uh, shark ecology the fish ID course that um, we're putting together is going to be very Hawaii centric. Um, I'm, the fish ID course that we do through uh, SSI is going to uh, focus primarily on endemic species that represent the different classes of fish in Hawaii. Um, that's gonna be for sure how we do that. Shark ecology will also be doing in the future as well. Um, uh, one of the things, if you don't want to miss any of that, uh, you know, email me. I'll send you a link to make sure you can update your email preferences so that you specifically get notified if we're running a class like that. Otherwise, you know, we're going to be publishing that in the near future. Until we open up, this is the only thing the dive shop is really doing. So, <laughs> so good. Does anybody have any questions, like to talk about anything, see anything again? Um, it's open floor at this point. And also, if you are on the East Coast and you were tired and you were in Texas and you were tired and you want to go, you are released from class. You have completed what you need to do. And now you just have a, a chance to ask me any questions or go over anything if you would like. And so thank you very much for coming, you guys. And uh, I'm going to open the floor to anybody who wants to. Uh, say anything. Go ahead, Sheila. Um, did the online learning portion talk about how to tell the difference between male and female turtles? It did not. <sighs> we in Hawaii do know a little bit about that um, for green sea turtles, especially. Yeah, so Sheila is a is a boat captain on that boat, one of those dive sites, and so she sees turtles all the time. So why don't you? Um, now, I'm not actually sure. She is going to tell you about how to tell the difference. I'm not actually sure if that's true for all the species, but why don't you tell them what we know, at least for green sea turtles? Um, green sea turtles, the main way that we can tell the difference just by looking at them of a male and female is that the males have a very long, wide tail, just like you're about to see on Matt's background, um, really big, fat long tail and the females of the green sea turtles in particular have a triangular mine just went off and oh, we can still hear you okay have a triangular um short tail but that's specific to green sea turtles as far as i know Yes, that uh, I, I didn't. I didn't even really notice when I was going through the material that they did not talk about all about identifying the species. But that's very true for green sea turtles. If the tail is really fat and long, it's definitely a male. And the short, skinny ones are uh, are the well, they're not skinny. Yeah, the, they're, they're like short. wide and triangular shaped are the females. Yeah. <clears throat> and the bigger the turtle, the more pronounced the male's tail will be. That's just my little tidbit. No, no, it was good. That's why we're here, enrich, enriching the online learning material. So, so that else? turtle right behind you now, Matt, that's a male, right? Yeah. Let's, well, let's, that's uh, a loggerhead. So we're it's a loggerhead turtle. So um, Sheila and I both, uh, being you know Hawaiian boat captains and Hawaiian divers, got a lot less experience in the environments that we take these trips to, right? Uh, but that loggerhead turtle behind me definitely had the big tail, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, in Hawaii, we would be like, yeah, that's definitely a male. But because it's a loggerhead, we're not sure. We're not sure. Well, this was very interesting. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Anybody else? So what what is the easiest way in sort of in the wild to tell the difference between a green sea turtle and a loggerhead? Oh. Sort of the head. head. Did you uh let's go back to that video? The um, loggerhead, like we saw them um in Cozumel and in Belize. And we're so used to seeing the green sea turtles, it was actually a little disturbing to see. It looked like a linebacker of a green sea turtle. That, um, that head, um, it, it, it's not the same, right? It's, <laughs> it's twice not, as big. It's very... It, compared to the to the size of the shell of the uh, turtle. Like if that was a green sea turtle, that body that went with that head would be another 50% bigger at least, right? 